All right, so tonight we're beginning on page 103 in your workbook. This is the, the final session of Heart in Focus. And you might recall, as I mentioned before, that it's, it's basically five sessions where we talk about the different aspects of maintaining that focus um, and understanding the pull of the old self versus the draw of the new self, um, and the pull of the new self, the new heart, and the struggle of keeping one's heart in focus as we manage the gifts that God has given to us um, here in our lives. And so tonight, we're just kind of wrapping it all together and touching on um, something that I know I'd, I've talked about a couple of times now. We actually have a slide about it tonight if you're following along on YouTube. Uh, special welcome to those following along through our Facebook group. If you are watching along, feel free to say hi. Just drop a comment down in the comments down below. Uh, so we have a record of your visit. Thank you. And, um, and this video, again, is going to be hosted at YouTube and also published to our podcast. If you do not have a workbook, contact me, Pastor Hagen, and I'll get one out to you in the mail. Um, and you can work through it all at your own pace, at your own speed. And, um, and then if you have any questions, either about the content or other more specific questions, um, you can contact me, Pastor Hagen. And if I don't have the answer for you, I can point you to somebody who would. With that, um, tonight, session six, keeping your focus, focus, F-O-C-U-S, Remember in the last five sessions, so what we mentioned, fix your eyes on lasting treasure um, as opposed to the, the temporal things of this world that pass away, whether through rust or moth, uh, where thieves break in and steal, um, or even through words that we've become accustomed to hearing now, talking about inflation or deflation or stagflation or anything in between. Um, fix your eyes on lasting treasure, the eternal blessing of heaven. Secondly, overcoming worry, um, because one of the things that, that we kind of see in one of these upcoming slides is that it's a lot easier to deal with our worry by trying to forget about it and by trying to pretend it's not there. Um, but ignoring it doesn't make the problem go away. It just makes it even worse and even more intimidating for us to overcome. And so that's why overcoming worry is you know, dealing with our heart dealing with the emotions of the heart, the worries of the heart. Uh, FOC, conquer the obstacles. Um, obstacles such as, you know, maybe some, some poor choices in the past. Obstacles such as, you know, worldwide pandemics that kind of throw a wrench in our plans um, or that, that severely impact our, our work or our place of business or something like that. Lots of obstacles that might be in the way. Um, you use his money wisely, use God's money wisely. And what we're talking about there is maintaining that focus that you are here as a steward of the blessings that God has given to you. And, um, and these temporary blessings that he's given to you for use in this world can be used to, to bring about eternal blessing and eternal gain. Um, to think that, you know, using some of the wealth that Jesus has entrusted to us and returning a portion of that to him um, and using that in service to his ministry. And it's, it's not just, you know, not just talking about finances there, but also time and, uh, and the attention that we might give to the Lord's ministry in our particular area. Um, using, but this specific course, obviously talking about money management, um, using God's money wisely. Um, investing for what will have a lasting return rather than merely a temporary return. And then finally, uh, shifting your priorities. Um, so maintaining that focus, keeping our heart in focus, and, um, and that the priorities are seen in the way that we spend our time, spend our attention, spend our money. And so tonight, um, maintaining our focus, keeping this focus. And this is, this will be picking up on page 105 in your student workbook. And um, the first question, top of the page there, the following groups might view finances differently. Identify some of those differences. Um, there's a couple of them here. First, male versus female. Some of the differences um, between, you know, generally speaking, here we're just talking about generalizations of course. Um, but generally speaking, how might, how might your average woman deal with finances or think about finances or view them um, in a way as relates to the average man? 
you can think about that for yourself and take a moment to jot something down if there and, and make it as specific as you like, because it's your workbook. <laughs> you know, I'm not collecting these. We're not having a quiz or a test on it. Um, but particularly talking about maybe it's it's better seen in your own social group. Um, the expectations of, you know, if you're a guy, the expectations from the men that you would hang out with versus um, if you're a woman, the expectations from your the, the ladies that you might hang out with or spend time with. Um, just off the top of the head, um, you know, the, the thoughts that kind of come to mind um, might be, you know, maybe the guys that you hang out with, they, they really enjoy the idea of, of a big truck and a big TV where they can um, get, get really involved in, their, in, their, in the game. You know, whether it's hockey or baseball or football, um, maybe there's the expectation that you're going to be going out to going out to, you know, the mud hens or, you know, a baseball game or a hockey game, um, at least when when those things are able to be had. And uh, and you're going to drop a you know, hundred bucks on, on beers and snacks the whole time there. Um, ladies, maybe the expectation for you from your social group or from your acquaintances, if you expand that circle just a little bit, maybe the expectations are a little bit different. Um, maybe not. Maybe, you know, the, it's not the expectation of going out to the bar after the game for another round or two of beverages. Um, but maybe it's the expectation that, you know, you want to get away for a while. And so we're all going to have a shopping day and, um, and hit the drive through. And then we're just going to, you know, shop to a drop, you know, back in the days of, of the, the heyday of the shopping mall. Um, and maybe the expectations are different. Um, maybe there's expectations or the way that we view finances related to um, how we present ourselves in public. And, you know, as a, as a guy, I'm thankful that, that the, that, uh, you know, hair clippers are available on Amazon for, you know, 30 or 40 bucks and you get a decent pair. Um, and I really am sympathetic toward, toward women in that regard. You know, if you have to go to a stylist and get your hair done so that you, um, you have the same level of professionalism as a guy who just spent 10 minutes with the clippers in his own kitchen. It's, um, you know, how, how it's as much how men or women might view finances differently and you can't get away from the expectations that would be on men or women in social situations or perhaps cultural expectations. And the big idea here, and I'm talking a lot about this one, the others won't be as long, but the big idea here is to be clear-minded about how we see these expectations so that we maintain our focus. See how that kind of works in. Um, how about this next one, saver versus spender? This was, um, this was a Dave Ramsey uh, division, I, I believe, um, that typically in most households, you'll have somebody who tends to be a saver um, and then somebody who tends to be a spender. And this might delve a little bit into some of the pre-work at the beginning of the workbook where we talk about um, you know, your financial history or, or how your family viewed finances in the household of where you grew up, um, but saver versus spender. And you know, the, the saver is planning and wanting to be frugal, maybe wanting to be cheap. Um, and the spender is they isn't isn't a bad thing. It's you know somebody who wants to have fun, wants to enjoy things, and and the the saver needs the spender to have fun, and the spender you know needs the saving mindset um, to be able to continue having fun instead of being a, a slave to debt and really you know <laughs> losing out on the blessing and opportunity and not keeping one's focus. Um, so saver versus spender might be another division to think about there. And um, go ahead and jot something down there, how they might view finances differently or how that might affect, in particular, affect a relationship or affect um, household finances, for instance. And then finally, um, the third one that we have here is this idea of a free spirit versus control freak. Um, not to use, you know, that's obviously some loaded terminology and uh, free spirit versus control freak. And maybe it touches a little bit on saver versus spender, but not necessarily. Um, you know, the free spirit who just kind of goes day to day and um, very laid back and whatever happens, happens. And if I feel you know, feel the urge to do this, or maybe I feel the, the urge to, um, you know, to make my lunch at home this morning because I woke up early and it was fantastic. 
you know, very free spirit versus somebody who is a little bit more rigid or regimented um, or even disciplined, perhaps. Um, not that one or the other is inherently good or evil, but somebody who is a little bit more organized or disciplined might say, here's what I do. Here's when I do it. Here's the, you know, it's a Tuesday. So I'm having tuna on Tuesday or tacos on Tuesday or whatever it is. And here's the way that I chart out my family budget or my own spending down to the last penny. Kind of, I think that's where they're kind of going with this, this question of, you know, somebody who really pays attention and has a routine that they really stick to versus somebody who just kind of goes with the flow. And, um, and each of those might be, have a saver or a spender tendency as well. You know, it's kind of, you know, some overlap there, kind of like um, uh, a quadrant where you might be a saver and a free spirit or a saver and a control freak, a spender and free spirit, friend, spender and control freak. And then the last one, um, I didn't, this isn't in your book, but it's, you know, talking about different groups viewing finances differently. You think of the generations. Um, maybe if you grew up with parents or grandparents or, or knew your great grandparents and, and the stories of them living through the great depression or, or the rationing of World War II or something like that. Um, the stories of really, really working to make ends meet and having some serious concerns at times about being able to put food on the table or going to bed with, uh, with an empty stomach because they just, they could only afford one meal that day, something like that. Um, versus, you know, somebody of that era versus somebody of a later era, whether it was, you know, the baby boomer generation or uh, generation X um, or, you know, generation Y or millennial generation. Um, and then most recently those in their early twenties would be like, um, you know, teenagers and early twenties would be I gen or generation Z, um, which, and, and just how those generations as, as a broad, broad scope, broad swath, might approach their views on money. All right, so hopefully that gets us into keeping our focus and understanding all of these different tendencies a little bit and to, to see that, that there are tendencies, first of all, that want to pull our focus in these different directions. And then secondly, how do you manage that in a way that is respectful and loving and communicative? which kind of touches on this triangle that we've got on the screen. Um, the, the triangle that we've talked about a couple of times, it generally has three parts. And this is, this is more so for um, managing a household of two or more people. You've got you know, financial knowledge. You've got the, the emotions of managing money. And you've got communication about managing money. And you need all three there. And if one of them is missing or one of them is severely deficient, then life becomes much more difficult and the relationship is much more strained. Um, which of these would be the most challenging for you in your household? Uh, maybe one ha really has an excellent grasp on financial knowledge or maybe, um, maybe the other, but maybe the other comes with some real clarity emotionally about money and really a, a clear understanding about the role of money in a Christian's life. Um, maybe the communication in that relationship breaks down where they both think they're on the same page, but they didn't talk about it. Anyway, um, in our workbook, page 105, who makes the financial decisions in your household? Obviously more pressing pertinent question if you're married um, and you're managing your household finances together. Um, and and sometimes, and <laughs> this is going to almost sound like a soapbox, uh, but it's not, I promise you. Um, sometimes a couple will think that they've got it solved when each one is working and they both, you know, pay some money into a joint account, um, at, you know, for mortgage and groceries and gas and whatever. Um, but then they each have their own separate accounts for fun money or, you know, planning for a, a trip with, with the friends or something like that. Um, and maybe in some cases, that division of finances is even greater. And pastorally, what I, what I can say here um, and is that I've been a pastor now for, you know, nine years, nine and a half years, something like that. It'll be 10 years this next August. And every couple that I've ever had in my office for um, couples counseling, where we talk about, you know, trouble in the marriage generally, 
Um, every couple that is in my office for pastoral counseling has had separate accounts. Now that, <laughs> and but we have to understand that properly. Um, just because a couple has separate separate accounts doesn't mean that they will have they will have trouble and strife in their marriage. Um, but I guess my observation is that those who generally have a joint account, who who have you know shared custody of all of their funds, um, in that case they are forced to figure it out pretty early on. Figure out this triangle. Um, talk about the financial knowledge and what each one brings to the table. Maybe they go do some learning together, talk about the emotions of managing it, and most of all, communication about managing it. And that's one of the things that I really encourage um, young people who come for, you know, I take them through a pre-marriage course before they get married at some point. And it, um, and it really helps with the longevity of the marriage and hopefully helps to smooth out some of the bumps along the way. And, but one of the main things when we talk about finances is, you know, I say, number one, you know, obviously we offer this course and it'll be hosted at our website, but then number two, make sure, make sure, make sure that you work on this triangle, financial knowledge, the emotion and the communication. And one of the major tools in accomplishing that and being forced into it <laughs> to figure it out is having joint shared custody of all of your funds. No, his, his account and her account kind of arrangement because that doesn't make for a, a healthy working order. So a small group discussion uh, there at bottom of page 105 obstacles to implementation. You can take a few moments, you can hit pause on the video um, if you'd like, or listening on the podcast, go ahead and hit pause after I read the question here. Identify potential obstacles that may stand in the way of implementing a successful spending plan. What are some obstacles? Include the things and the experience that have knocked you off course in the past. And the things and experiences that have knocked you off course in the past, um, you know, it's going to be one of these three things on the screen and maybe two and maybe all three um, and compounding that with choices that we've made in the past might have ongoing effects even today where if you know a, a past previous decision was to declare bankruptcy that bankruptcy is going to remain on your credit report for seven years before it falls off and it never really completely disappears um, and that is that's going to limit your options as time goes on and in addition to that, um, that bankruptcy filing um, doesn't really get to the core of the issue, which is the heart, the pull of the old self, the pull of the new self, um, just, as, just as an example. Um, but the main three things that we're talking about here, um, obstacles that you have experienced in the past, and it'll generally be one of these three, financial knowledge, communication, or emotion. Um, for this question, you could add also, you know, the, the ramifications of, of past decisions. So go ahead and take a few moments with that. Feel free to hit pause now. And then the verse at the bottom of the page from 1 Corinthians 9. Verses 24 through 26, run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. Um, there, Paul is talking about his focus, focus ministry, his gospel ministry. Um, but by extension, some of the application that you might draw from there is, you know, just generally speaking, if Usain Bolt wants to win, wants to win a race, he's going to be focused on the finish line and focused on the mechanics of his running. He's not going to be distracted by absolutely everything. Um, he's focused on and keeping his focus where it needs to be. And that's kind of the same thing that we're dealing with tonight, keeping our focus. All right, going on to page 106, balancing the spending plan. All the steps you'll take in this session will help you reach the goals you have identified for your life. During this segment, you'll review your entire spending plan and make any additional adjustments. Complete all the categories in the plan. Add up the, the expenses on your spending plan worksheet. Complete the box in the lower right-hand corner of the worksheet. Calculate whether the income is over or under the expense line of the same box. And uh, example here on the, on the page or on the, 
on your screen. And the point here is to basically, you know, to borrow a phrase, to give every dollar a job, to give, not to say, you know, we're going to have all oh, this $200 left over at the end of the month. Well, what do you want to do with that? Even if that $200 or whatever it is, is going toward your emergency fund um, or going toward whatever cause happens to be on your mind right now or whatever the most pressing need may be. Um, but to, to look at their income and keeping in mind kind of the, the order of things that, that we've talked about a couple of times, um, keeping in, in mind the way that God wants us to be managers who are faithful, um, to give everything a job, even if that job is something as, you know, seemingly mundane as paying the taxes or um, having a little bit in, of a cushion in savings. So then after you've calculated this, then we adjust the spending plan of three possible results. Uh, maybe income exceeds expenses. So you've got a surplus of cash at the end of the month. Maybe e income equals expenses where every dollar was given a job and uh, one way or another. And um, that isn't necessarily you know, the most comfortable place to be either, especially if it means every spare dollar is going toward debt or something like that. Um, but at least you, you have a handle on what the fixed expenses are of your rent or your housing costs or something like that. And you know that if you maintain this and you keep your focus on this spending plan, then it's going to be okay. Maybe expenses exceed income. And, um, and that's, that's the more difficult place to be. Then this is on page 106. Uh, the solutions either increase your income or de decrease your expenses to balance the spending plan. Um, if income is simply increased, such as a second job or a spouse begins work or maybe increasing hours or something like that, the issue may still not be satisfactorily addressed. Um, that's the solution, you know, it's easier. Consider the following options here. Uh, maybe seeking a temporary extra income source or reducing the variable expenses or rethinking some fixed expenses. Um, I know of, I know of one, one person that I was just listening to on a, actually on a podcast today. Um, he sold out, or he got out of his lease in a very expensive area of town. And, um, and he actually ended up, you know, finding a different job and taking a little bit of the savings to live in a, live in a travel trailer for, you know, a good year and a half or two years it was a little extreme, but it really, it was really a, a life changing experience for him in more ways than one. Um, the options of maybe a temporary extra income source or reducing your variable expenses. Those are the things that, you know, like groceries, you have to have food every month, but you don't have to necessarily be purchasing the same, uh, the same things. There are cost effective ways to, to eat in a healthy way. Um, and I guess on, on that, um, the encouragement that that I follow from a guy named Michael Pollan, P-O-L-L-A-N, got to check out his book, especially, he's got one recently about caffeine, um, but one also called The Omnivore's Dilemma, and his his kind of rules for, for shopping, for eating, <laughs> eat real food and not too much. Um, and so basically, he says, you shop your way around the out, outside of the grocery store, and then you're good, because there you'll find your vegetables or potatoes, your eggs. Um, you know, milk and cheese and that sort of a thing. And, um, and maybe a couple of other things that you would need from the middle to round it out. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, I could talk about food as much as I could talk about, talk about godly stewardship, I suppose. Finally, bottom of page 106, the spending plan is one of the most effective tools for wise money management because it puts in black and white on the page um, exactly where things are going. And it, it kind of addresses or at least provides opportunity to address all three uh, corners of that triangle, the financial knowledge, the emotions of money, and the communication about money. You know, work through it together as, as a household or as a couple and, um, and say, here's, here's what we can do. Here's where we are at and how are you feeling right now? Uh, top of page 107. And that, that conversation, how are you feeling right now? Um, that might be something, you know, especially if it's something that you, that, that has been a struggle in the past or that you haven't looked at recently. Um, that's something to approach with a little delicacy and compassion and empathy. And with the solid understanding that, you know, 
if you're married. Um, yeah, most people, most people who have kids at home aren't necessarily having this conversation with their kids, although they probably should be. But as a husband and wife, you, you know, you look across the table or you look to the person next to you and you're like, this is the person who has tied their life to mine. They think the world of me, they want a, they want to build a life with me. So let's figure it out together. Um, even if blame could be assigned one way or another, you know, this is, this is a household discussion. Page 107, uh, the spending plan activity would be making adjustments to balance it so that income equals expenses. That's the goal. If income meets or exceeds expenses, um, when income meets or exceeds, identify additional adjustments that will help you put more dollars toward meeting your long-term financial goals. And then write down some action steps. That's page 107. And bottom of 107, if expenses exceed income, then reductions are needed. Evaluate alternatives to reduce expenses in urgent situations, increase income. That is, you know, might be more easily said than done. Um, but weigh the pros and cons of each choice and seek the opinions of others. Pray for God's guidance. Um, that that can be a very difficult spot to be in. And, you know, if reach out to me, Pastor Hagen, if you have any questions or you would like to speak confidentially about that. And if I can't provide the, the answer, at least some, some comfort based on the word of God, um, then I will be able to point you to somebody who would be able to help with some financial knowledge and communication together. Page 108, putting it into action, putting the spending plan into action. Um, this spending plan is used to develop some accountability and generate data by tracking your spending. Um, that's, that's one of the most beneficial things is if you do this for a few months, you can look back, what are the trends? Um, and what do we typically spend on groceries or gas or whatever it may be um, over time? Um, increase communication and trust because this is something that you both can see and that you have both agreed to stick to. And if you want to change it, then you got to talk about it. Um, use a spending plan to spend wisely, where you think ahead of time where you want the money to go and how you want to put that money to use um, toward your godly goals or toward the needs that, that and responsibilities that you have. And use that spending plan to even multiply some savings um, to really say, well, do we really need that? Or could we put an extra 20 bucks as a you know, set aside for a rainy day or set aside for, for the future. Um, some types of systems, and this is kind of the, what's on your screen right now. Um, three basic types, a cash-based system, a paper ledger, or an electronic ledger. Um, electronic options have really exploded over the last few years, especially with uh, the variety of apps that are available. Um, there are a few like you need a budget or envelopes with the letter M, envelopes. Um, those are those two are very popular. Or if you check out, I believe it's nerdwallet.com or uh, the guy I've recommended before, clarkhoward.com. You just do a little bit of searching at some of those websites and you could find a few recommendations. Um, some of them, some of the electronic options like that and are, are cloud-based where you just link your, link your information in the cloud and you can go to the website through that app and then you can see how it all fits together. Um, some will synchronize with your bank account or your checking account, your credit card, whatever it may be. And, um, and they, they promise encryption, at least most of them do in their terms and conditions. And, um, and then you can see it. But the, there's some pros and cons of all of this. And there's a lot more here on page 108. And then in the appendices or the appendixes at the back of the book some pros and cons, um, a cash-based envelope system. Well, once you're out of cash in that envelope, then you need, if you want to <laughs> use some more, um, do some more spending in that category, such as, you know, groceries or cats or entertainment, then the cash has to come from a different envelope and you're physically exchanging cash from one envelope to another, a paper ledger going through the process of sitting down and writing it down. The, the fallback on the electronic ledger are the, one of the perhaps, perhaps one of the downfalls there, I suppose, would be if it is all done automatically, it might be easier to see. And you have to know if that's going to work for you or not. 
Um, and most of these things give like a free trial or something like that. But if you, is it going to work for you to have everything entered in automatically? And then you just have to go in every, every other day or whatever, and make sure that you categorize all your purchases properly. Um, or do you need something that's going to be a little bit more hands-on kind of that free spirit versus control freak discussion from earlier in the lesson. So top of page 109 would be set up your record keeping system. And um, you can try try a few out. Um, even the, the simple the simple practice of carrying a, a little notebook, you know, one of those like pocket sized notebooks that cost ten cents at the at the dollar store, right? Um, and you carry that around for for a week, maybe maybe ten days, and you write down every time you spend something, um, whether it's you know a dollar for water. Or, or the gas or the groceries, you write down what the, what the amount was and what the item was or what the category was, you know, like $200 for groceries and, you know, and then $27 for gas and then, oh yeah, 75 cents for a chocolate bar, whatever it may be. And if you do that for, you know, a week, 10 days, maybe two weeks, that gives you a little bit more insight on your actual spending habits, as well as some awareness to it. And that insight can be useful in, in adjusting your own spending plan. And the awareness can be helpful in reducing some of those frivolous expenditures. Um, page 109, if you're married, decide who will be the main manager of the account. But when filling in the spending plan, both need to be involved and buy in. And um, when you talk about the main manager, um, we're talking about, you know, you both have access to the account, you have shared custody of the account, but generally speaking, one person is more interested in or perhaps more skilled at um, doing the math and planning for, you know, planning for your spending plan or keeping with it or communicating about it. Um, number two, decide which record keeping system is best for you or at least you know it's it's better to start and try it rather than saying this one's best and so we're going to do that um just try one out and if that doesn't work try the next one out maybe maybe you have some sort of a hybrid um where it's the equivalent of a paper record, but it's actually a shared document that you can both access, you know, through your phone or something like that, like a shared Google Doc. And you have to actually physically enter the information there, but you can both see it. Um, whatever the case may be, there are there are a lot of free, you know, spreadsheet templates available for this as well. Um, and I know a number of people who have used that Google Doc in order to you know, for at least uh, as a starting point. Uh, number three, if the paper or electronic ledger system is used, transfer the numbers from your spending plan worksheet to the spending plan and record forms daily and monthly. If you need more copies of the worksheet, let me know. Uh, most of this is in the appendices at the back of the book, page 135 and following. And then finally, if you're using the cash-based envelope system, transfer the spending accounts that will be paid by cash that, that's just, you put the cash in the envelope and the name of the category is on the front of the envelope. And when you go to the grocery store, you grab the envelope or you grab whatever, you know, a few couple bucks out of the envelope in order to pay for it. And then whatever change you get goes back into that envelope and, you know, physical paper, paper money. And then, you know, change goes into the change jar or whatever. Um, so if you're using that cash-based envelope system, transfer the spending accounts that will be paid by cash to the cash-based envelope form. Then transfer those that will be paid by check, fixed in a few variable to that same form. And we're talking there about, you know, automatic withdrawals, especially on, you know, for utility bills and uh, that sort of a thing. So far, so good. Keeping your focus. Um, it's a daily discipline. It's helpful Number one, to keep things simple. If it's convoluted and, um, and extensive and it takes a lot of work or memory and a lot of moving things around, um, then you are probably less likely to make it happen. There are some things that you can make automatic, um, such as you know, direct 
direct deduction. You know, our, our church here at Resurrection offers um, automatic offerings through Vanco, and you can you can set it up as a one-time offering or as a recurring gift. Um, and whether you know once a month for some people, or maybe twice a month, or every other week, or something like that, whatever whatever your plan happens to be, it doesn't doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and but but that simplicity of of setting up the the spending plan of what you want to spend and where you want to spend it, and then being able to automate that so you don't have to worry about it anymore, as long as you've got the cash there to cover it. You know, and they're talking about you know offerings or bill pay for utilities and the water and the cell phone or whatever the case may be. Um, maybe online banking, bill pay transfers. Um, do a lot of like for us, we do pretty much all of our banking online where you can just take a picture of the check and then the check is deposited into your account um, a day later and then you can move money back and forth online. That's uh, super easy. Um, so the three things, keeping our focus, keeping things simple, making as much of it automatic as you can and thinking priorities with every choice. That's really the big, the big pull here there on your workbook page 110 income goes first of all to giving and then to basic care and savings um, that savings includes emergency savings long-term savings savings for a major purchase um, and hopefully by that time you know eventually you're working away to having debt entirely paid off at least aside from the house um, and then finally spending and spending uh, Page 110, striving to remember the pull with each and every choice. And the spending plan is one of the most effective tools for wise money management. The success of the spending plan is found in making wise daily choices. And um, kind of a checklist on here on page 110. It's also on page 140 in your book. Um, this is where this is from. Giving honorably to the Lord, saving $1,000 for emergency plan, debt elimination plan, um, tax advantage savings, you know, such as a Roth IRA where you're putting in money that has already been taxed, but then it can grow tax-free or with be withdrawn tax-free or whatever it is. Um, a large purchase savings fund, you know, such as a car or a house, um, emergency savings that works your way up to three to five months of actual expenses, maybe a savings for children's ed education, maybe, are, or maybe paying off a house early. There are exceptions to that. Um, and then looking ahead to increase long-term savings. Here's a checklist on page 140 in your workbook. So finally, commitment. Um, this is on page 111. Commitment, first of all, to Christ as our top priority. Um, over and above everything and anything else. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus said that in the Gospel of Matthew, verse, chapter 6, verse 33. Commitment to Christ. Secondly, a change of perspective. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Talk about perspective. And finally, the courage to be decisive and start now. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. Page 112, keeping our focus and making a commitment. Um, this is the written commitment plan, just something to, to work through together and build in some accountability. Uh, we will evaluate our current financial habits and behaviors and be prepared to forge new habits, behaviors where appropriate. Number two, we'll do what's necessary to implement a detailed spending plan with a start date. Number three, this is all on page 112. The time we will set aside in our schedule for finances is, you know, just a regular recurring, you know, weekly thing um, or maybe daily thing if things are you know kind of tight and dire right now, um, at least until you know things get a little bit better. Our accountability partner is, you know, most logical choice is your spouse. Um, if you're 
if you're a single person or you know you're the only one in your household um, then you know, find a good friend that you can talk to um, or even your pastor <laughs> and number five i'll pray for god's power and guidance to address money issues solomon said in proverbs 16 commit your commit to the lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed in in his heart a man plans his course but the lord determines his steps so that commitment um at least talking through th what are the nuts and bolts of making sure we can stick to this and work through it together um as far as keeping that commitment it takes greater strength that the christian life is one of a continual down arrow from god to us um, as of greater, much greater emphasis than the up arrow of our action for God. And so keeping our commitment means, number one, growing in God's word, growing in God's grace through word and regular worship, and your pastor will visit you with the sacrament. Number two, ask God daily for wisdom and power to make necessary changes. Number three, review your list of financial objectives each week. And they were talking about, you know, goals and uh, an action plan. Uh, number four, commit to use your spending plan for at least 12 weeks, um, three months. Be ready to modify and adjust as needed. It becomes easier each week and sets a pattern for your life because the biggest, the biggest issue here is changing behavior, recognizing it, dealing with it, addressing the heart issue behind it, the pull of the old self, the pull of the new self, and changing the behavior and the attitude. Um, and, you know, the triangle, uh, the financial knowledge, the emotion about money, and the implementation and the communication of that. Uh, number five, seek assistance if needed. And then finally, be sure to celebrate the many blessings God has given to you and praise him for them. James chapter one, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. Uh, support for your commitment. Plans fail without good advice. Oh, wrong one. Plans fail without good advice, but they succeed when there are many advisors. The path of life leads up for those who are wise. Anyone who accepts being corrected gains understanding. So you got to know when do you need to seek additional assistance or advice? Um, maybe from a friend or a mentor, maybe a church sponsored support group, uh, maybe reading some financial books or periodicals or websites, you know, um, I really like clarkhoward.com. I think he has good, or you might have to do a search for him. Um, I know, you know, Dave Ramsey has a lot of stuff at his website or the website nerd wallet is, uh, is kind of interesting. Um, and most of these places disclose when they have a vested interest in advertising dollars. So take it with a grain of salt on occasion. Um, and I know there are, there are others that are, you know, more, perhaps more informative, but aren't as flashy and, and popular. <laughs> um, a reliable debt counselor and a, or a financial advisor. So what are your plans for follow-up support and further learning? Um, you know, one of my, another one that might be interesting um, would be the podcast called Radical Personal Finance. The guy who runs it has all sorts of de all sorts of degrees in um, in financial advice, and he's got all the licenses. And he did that on his own, or he did that as part of a company for a long time. And then he decided to um, basically quit and retire and start his own business. and And it kind of he has his own website and everything. Um, but check it out. Uh, radical personal finance you check it out and um and he's got the financial chops to talk about these things with a lot more depth and he comes from a fairly fairly solid christian background i believe he's a uh conservative devout catholic man um with a you know young family like three or four kids at home i believe and um and a lot of what he does is dealing with this issue and anyway that might be worthwhile as well, talking about different resources. So living with a new perspective means having your heart in focus. Paul said, 
Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. So a review from this session. Uh, what new insights did you learn in this session that you would wish to incorporate? Or what helpful experience can you share with others? Um, encouragement and accountability. Any successes that you can report or struggles that you are having? And how can we help? Finally, bottom of page 114, our action plan for the, from this session. Main action items. I have to page back through tonight's uh, lesson and see what needs to be done and put a date on it. So page 115, your personal action plan. And this is uh, at the end of the book, page 140 in the appendix. Review the action plans you listed at the end of each lesson Identify the things you need to do. If you're married, work as a team to decide how to proceed. Then use the personal action checklist, appendix page 140, and write them down. Get it written down, talk about it, and then prioritize them, obviously. And then start working on it together. So in summary, uh, first of all, thank you for joining us uh, for Heart in Focus. Tonight was session six, keeping your focus. Focus, obviously, an acronym reminding us to fix your eyes on lasting treasure, to overcome worry, conquer the obstacles, use God's money wisely, and shift your priorities. In summary, student workbook page 116. Money plays a big role in everything we do, it affects our time, our energy, our relationships, our potential impact. It can be a trap or a tool. It can build up relationships or tear them down. It can be a means to express our connection to God or cause us to drift away. Some say you need to control your money or it will control you, but money isn't the problem. Our hearts are the biggest challenge, especially with the deceptive temptations around us. More than ever they, in our world today, we need to deal with the struggles in our hearts so that they can remain in focus. Keep in mind your higher calling. Notice those things that compete with Jesus in your life. Let him take captive every thought and action to glorify God and serve our neighbors. When asking others what seems to be the hardest part of getting their financial lives in focus, the most frequent response is discipline. The spending plan is a vehicle to provide discipline to your spending. The careful management of money is not so much to make you rich or to keep you from, from poverty. It's the preparation needed to position you to do what God has intended for your life. As you establish your spending plan, always remember that in Jesus, we have a treasure that is greater than all this life can offer. Our Heavenly Father, in our he Heavenly Father watches over each step of the journey with his providing hand. Look to him for strength to overcome the obstacles as you faithfully manage the resources that God has entrusted to you. Then with a clear view of your calling in life, shift your priorities to accomplish God's purposes for you. The purpose of this session is to take you from talk to action. It's time to get serious about it. Be, be prepared for a journey that will have its ups and downs. It may take months, maybe many months before you even finish readjusting a spending plan that meets your realities as well as your goals. Don't forget to continue to gain helpful advice along the way and to have an accountability partner. Finally, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he'll provide a means to accomplish your calling. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll close with prayer. Dear, dear all-powerful Father in heaven, you understand the challenges of my life. Give me self-control and courage to carry through with the goals I have set. Keep my heart in focus and provide strength along the way. When I fall, pick me up. When I get off track, restore me to the right path. Through all of this, help me to remember who you are and what you have made me in Jesus. Let my efforts to improve my financial lifestyle be a catalyst to live every aspect of my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. That wraps us up, takes us to the back 
part of the book. Um, you've got your appendix with all the forms. And uh, just let me know if you'd like a few more of those. I can get them sent to you um, either in PDF or in paper format. And if you know of somebody, um, first of all, I thank you for <laughs> joining us for this entire time. Uh, send me a little bit of feedback if you're if you are so inclined, uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, or ways to improve. Um, and if you know of anybody who would likewise benefit from this course, please take a moment to refer them to me or to our, our website, or at least our Facebook or our YouTube page. I mean, uh, these videos are going to be at our website probably after Thanksgiving sometime, and, um, and there'll be a permanent fixture there at our website um, in order to provide some tangible way of Christian guidance for our everyday lives. That is to say, keeping our heart and focus. Thanks so much. God bless your day.